that uh, there's been such a gathering of people who have contributed to the hallucination concept so far, including everybody who's here who contributed to the album here on the hallucination, but also that uh, things are just expanding and becoming better and better going forward. So uh, with that, I will, I will give you over to Narcy, our moderator. How you guys doing? Everybody feel good? Yeah. So I'm going to skip the lengthy intros. We're going to get to know people directly for who they are and, and what they do. So we're just going to get into it. How are you guys feeling? Good. Okay. Um, I know you all on a different level personally, but I think it's important for us to track back to the idea of the hallucination through how people define themselves initially, right? So being that my parents are originally from the south of Iraq and Basra, and they were displaced in their generation in the 70s to the Emirates, which is sort of the interim space in the Arab world, and then moved out to Canada in the late 80s, and then that's where I started finding home, if you will, growing up here and then learning about the history of the land and eventually now being a part of the hallucination, right? Um, I'd like to know from each one of you what you define as your home or where you define as your home. Jen? My home is in, um, well, my home is wherever my son is, and I live in Connecticut, <coughs> in the state, but my ancestral homeland is in what's presently known as North Carolina, in the southeastern United States. <coughs> That's probably my deepest rooted home. Um, I don't feel really home when I'm there, though, because it's, it's so redneck. Even my people are kind of redneck now, and they've taken on a lot of that colonized way. So home is where I tour and the family I have on the road and my kid. But I still I still have to go home to that land because that's what informs everything. But I don't feel a total part of Trump red Trumpers. <laughs> how often how often do you touch that land? Do you go once a year? Or? I try to go a couple times a year. A couple times a year. Okay. Nice. You know? Um I guess I'm very comfortable in the in between now. Like I, 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 I believe like my my actual existence happens in a hyphen. Like it, I, I, I am I exist in the in the hyphen of with, with all my citizenships. Because um I'm not really too comfortable here and then I go to Colombia and I'm not really comfortable there. Like I have to be in a specific part of the country where no one is around so that I can feel comfortable yeah, and feel like I'm at home. Cause you know when I first when I first arrived here I was like the loudest of the loudest. Like I was super loud and happy but then, you know, two years living in London, Ontario, like it would crush your soul. <laughs> so I was not that like happy and jolly and you know, you think I'm happy now, <laughs> but I can't, I was even louder and I was even, so I guess now I'm at, I'm at this, like, I'm, I'm at this current, this current state of, I'm not, I'm not here and I'm not there and I can't be a hundred percent myself here, but I also can't be a hundred percent myself uh, in Colombia because I'm so un-Colombian, not because I'm not like girly and I don't fantasize about getting breast implants. Um, Let me ask you this, ha having kids, you had both your kids in Canada or, yeah, having kids on this land, did that change your relationship to, to like belonging more to the, less the culture, but more to the, the space that you live in? Well, I, I, I guess that my, my when, when I think about home, I just think about my apartment in Toronto and the people that come visit me that are the, the people that I call my chosen family now and I'm happy to bring kids into this world onto this land because of the chosen family that I have which are all sharing that same confusion like we all live in this confused but loving space so you know it, it Feels good. Like I at least feel safe in my little in my little bubble that I've that I've created for me and my family. What about you, Ben? Yeah, our home is multi-layered as well. Uh, I currently live in Ottawa, and I've lived there 
on and off since about uh, 96, 95, 96. Uh, but that's just the place I live, the place where I go to hide. <laughs> so it's where my home is, but it's not, I've never really felt at home in that city. Uh, although that's where the tribe came together and everything kind of worked out for me was there. But uh, formative years were here in like, Toronto. But very much the Toronto I grew up in. I mean, that, like I said, I left in '96, so mm -hmm. that Toronto, there's only little remnants of it here and there. Uh, so that home's kind of gone. I was born in Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. uh, which you know I've always been happy to have that part of my background. But I've also always been very happy that my family moved here. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I didn't have to grow up my my whole life there, or at least my formative years. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's uh, Six Nations, where my family's from, uh, which also I've never been at home at, but that's where you know the family roots are. Um, so yeah, the, the, like it's it, you know Jen was kind of touching on it, where uh, I feel that you know Indigenous people here, we have this special kind of homesickness, where like like you said, like your parents were displaced, you grew up in the Emirates and then moved here and found a home here. Mm -hmm. But like you still have that homeland yeah. where there's people who look like you, yeah, of course. who speak are from like this, speak like you, to that, you know, there's an anchor there mm -hmm. that allows you to come and find another home. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are in our homeland mm -hmm. and there's no, and it, it, there's no anchor. So there's that constant like search for, for what's home and it creates this weird homesickness. Yeah, I, th I think our relationship to colonial powers, whether they be, you know, back in the day or now, uh, in the last 20 years, I, I still don't define Canada as my home, but it's where I had my children, and I feel the most secure, like Lito was saying, right? But when I look back at Iraq, or even Basra, and I see what's going on back where my parents are from, it's hard for me to relate, because I've never experienced direct war or bombardment in my identity or my formation of home. So I'm still also in between, right? Whereas it must be completely different to be on the land that you belong to but still not feel like yeah. mm -hmm. settled in it, you know? Um, I think the common ground between all of us is that we found a creative outlet to, to become that hyphen, that space where we sort of navigate these thoughts and unload them and unpack them. And eventually it became in front of people and, and the shows and things like that. So tell me what music did for each one of you you know, where you draw your inspirations from in music and, and how it became a career. We'll start with the turn again. Oh, geez. Um, it started with my family. My older cousin pulled me in to sing professionally. Before that, though, my parents were both trained musicians, but I've never had any professional training. <coughs> and then before that, it goes to North Carolina. And that sort of informs a lot of stuff. And then next to that, with that, another layer is, I hate to keep harping on it, but it's the land. Mm. So when I write or compose, I actually will go outside, get a good listen, and sometimes melodies will come that sound like the birds I was just listening to, or, you know, like we really are the land. Like it informs at least the way I make music. That's beautiful. Or, I might, but I mean, everybody did that. Everybody does that. Even if you're not aware Even of if it, you're not thinking it about still it. gets in you. Yeah. And then, uh, unless I have something to say and I'm pissed off, <laughs> or I'm happy, then it'll come from that place of I have something to say, and the song will come out of that. That's what I create. Lido? I, I've always mm, had music as my escape. Um, the middle child. So, yeah, I was like the weird, the weird mid middle child who was obsessed with metal when she was 11 years old <laughs> in the north coast of Colombia. <laughs> not, not what, not what an 11 year old should be listening to. Um, and in my, my imagination, my imagination was my imagination. The things that I was creating sonically were the things that I was creating with my hands um, as a painter. So what, as I was painting, I was singing, and in our school, the music, the music program, 
was pretty good um, and Afro-Colombian music was taught in school, at least at mine. So I, I, was, I was drumming. And I was drumming and I, and I was singing um, these traditional songs. And, but then my mom wanted me to be, you know, girly. Um, she wanted me to, um, you know, maybe one day, who knows, become Miss Columbia, you know, be Miss Universe, you never know. And in Colombia, you, little girls, you know, they start with those dreams like really early on. Uh, so I started in dance too, but I didn't, I couldn't follow choreography. And I always ended up with the musicians. So we had the, the, the sessional like, drummers and singers, and, and then and I would just like take off my whatever costume that I had to wear, and I would just be in the back with the musicians. And that I just continued doing it. And I was in bands since I was 11, 12, 13, like my first serious band, I was 13 and everyone was my age now. So I took it very, 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 very seriously and it was, it was my, my, yeah, it was my, my voice. I had an opportunity to be heard. It was a space um, that I had to be respected because I went to the school that was a bilingual school and it was called the Lyndon B. Johnson School. Uh, so everyone in, that, that I went to school with, they were the children of diplomats and politicians and, and you know, very rich Colombians and a lot of um, North Americans that work at a mining Expense. corporation and they live in, in, they live in, in, um, in, in Barranquilla. So everyone, you know, so 90% of my classroom, they were like white Colombians or, or white kids and so I was this weird are you black are you Indian like what, what was happening so like my family would come see whatever talent show that I was a part of and everyone was just like what is what, like, are, like, are, 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 like is that your maid like you know like those would be the, the the comments because you know there was no kid in that school that would have like your mother is white like your mother is this you know, model person, you know, so music for me and art was an escape from being, you know, always feeling lesser than ev everyone else around me, but not knowing why, mm. because to me, the norm was to go to the desert and eat the brain of a goat, like that's normal. <laughs> Just like for those other kids, it was to go to McDonald's or whatever. So music became this place where I found acceptance. You know, when I was in my metal bands and my punk bands and at a very young age, I wasn't judged, I wasn't misrepresented, I wasn't questioned, my existence wasn't, you know, like I, I was accepted. So that's why music has been my life for so long. That's why the stage is the place that I am myself the most. It's the place that I have no fear, you know. Apart from being at home with my, with my kids, you know, the stage is, that place for me where I'm, I'm free, you know? Well, I know you're a visual guy, and I know there's been arts in your family for generations, you know? Um, what would you say music, when music came into your life, really became a, a vocation for you, you know? Why, why did you gravitate so far, so deep into it? We were talking about this the other day, like, how did music become so prevalent in your life? Yeah, well, I think it's always been very prevalent some of the earliest things that I remember like doing by myself is listening to music. Mm -hmm. I had like my little tape recorder like, that I remember going to. Uh, there was this this uh, record store in Buffalo that I was obsessed with because they had a, um, it was like a vending machine for tapes. Mm -hmm. The whole back of this record store had a conveyor belt. And you had to type in your number and the tape would fall out wow. and go down the conveyor belt and you have to go all the way down and pick it up. You know? and, uh, I was sitting in my room with my little tape recorder, and, I, and then I started. I realized I could record over. And then my dad actually broke out a tape recently of me singing. What? Yeah, yes, yeah, like you know, three or four years old on my on my little recorder. Uh, and you know, like I, I like I'll say it, like it's like music's been an obsession. Like it's something that like I couldn't get over when I was a kid. Like picking out sounds and wanting to know what 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 made every sound and just getting really meticulous about that. I remember doing that from a really young age. But 
uh, and like my, my family being an arts family, I remember getting put into you know various different music classes, and it, it wasn't something that I had an aptitude for playing yeah. music. Like it just yeah. it wasn't what I was good at. Um, and when I continued having this you know strong interest in music, and by the time I was a teenager, I had a crazy music collection and a pretty you know deep knowledge of, of the music that I was into, and uh, it was my friends that pushed me into DJing. I got like forced into it, uh, and DJing then became the obsession, and did that for years, even along anything else I was doing. But uh, visual arts became my main focus, and I had a fairly you know a, a rising career doing video art, and uh, that you know that was going great. And DJing became the thing that I did a couple times a month. You know, sat in at friends' nights or played house parties and stuff from time to time. Uh, and then before about, I don't know, I, I, I'd say a year or two before Tribe started, I started putting a lot of time into music again because I was getting a lot of gigs, doing like art openings and all. It was like a time when I was supporting myself in Ottawa and gathering up all the little jobs that you can get <laughs> in the art scene. So do edit, video editing for this dancer and do, 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 for 30 do, yeah, do, set, do security at the, uh, at the artist run center club and like, you know, just whatever I could to get by. And uh, not long after, like, but, so I started getting more and more energy. <laughs> it's also because it had become digital at that point. Uh, it's when I stopped using records and started, you know, I got my, my first tractor program and stuff. And uh, just happened that as I started putting more energy into it again, that's when Tribe came together. Uh, and it was a slow change over a few years where, you know, uh, Tribe started taking up more and more of my time, and slowly I was making less and less video art. Um, so really, you know. It's, it's a funny thing. On one hand, it's a total like fluke miracle that I'm making my living doing music. Like, it shouldn't, that's not, from everything I was doing, that's not where things should have ended up. At the same time, where I am today in my career and what I'm doing and what we represent and the way that we go about things, I've been raised to do since. <laughs> yeah, that's like, it's funny. Like, I find myself, all the things that I learned growing up, you know, all come into play now. Even the day, right down to like, what do you do when you're sick and tired and you're on tour and you have to play a show? Well, you play the show. Yeah, you have, <laughs> you have a choice. There's, you know, I think to this date, I've missed one tribe called Red show ever. Yeah. Um, when I tried back, like how I got into music and and how natural of a progression it was. You know, we're all like multidisciplinary in, 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 in our own way, but hip hop culture came to me at a very young age, right before I took a transition in my life and moved back to the Arab world. So like, I got a CD in my hand, a Wu-Tang CD in my hand and left with it, right? So it became like the soundtrack to the voyage between these two places. But also with hip hop, it, it, it took me into spaces that I wouldn't be in, like Compton, like, Obviously, some of them were like over-glorified, magnified versions of these realities, but it helped me want to go research other truths that are out there. So whether you look at the Moroccan experience in Marseille or the black experience in America. Or, and then when I started making music, it was almost like digging back into the history of my country. So as I was studying, I was making music, and then, I, and then obviously 9-11 happened and being questioned at borders and whatever. You start looking back into the history of Iraq, the history of the Arab world, and why things are happening the way they're happening now. So music helped me find, that hyphen space helped me find where I am in the history of my people, not just as an individual. And then meeting you guys helped me resituate myself in the history of where I stand on, a, on, a, on physical land, right? So the hallucination came at like a perfect time in my identity as a man, not even as a musician. I was in my early 30s and I had just had my first kid and I was like letting go of all those why whys and just accepting the moment as as was what it was and um, I remember when we moved here my father said to me he was like just remember that this is not your land and he didn't say to me like this is not your land you're never gonna be accepted he was actually the total opposite when it comes to patriotism but he was saying he's basically telling me remember when you get old enough study the history of this land and you guys were that beginning of that study for me. Like you birthed a newfound like respect and and search 
for the identity of this country. So I wanted to know from you two, before we get to Bear and the, the inception of the hallucination, at what point in your life did the hallucination come to you and it felt like serendipitous and perfect as a narrative to fit in your identity? Jen? Um, well, God, when I was in high school, mm. I started listening to John Trudell. Mm. And I've heard him mention hallucination later on, later on, before he inherited it, Jesus. And the next thing I know, we got to do gigs with him and got to know his grumpy ass. <laughs> and, um, and then we got to do a tour. And that's when I really, you know, we talked over dinner and in the bus, and you know what I mean? And that's when I really got exposed to to that and the concept. And then when the guys, when Bear and the guys took John's body of work, or took what John left and really made it into what it should be and what it is now, then I understood the full scope. But yeah, that's that was in high school because I never really knew it. So, and John Trudell really informed my uh, political everything. John Trudell and public energy. Mm -hmm. That was a very, <laughs> it informed my feminism. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, that was my big. No, that's just the truth. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Kiki and John Trudell is what it was all about. And this was tribal voice days. This was pre all the other stuff days. So that really informed me a lot. And then I started touring professionally when I was 17. Wow. So I just, you know, all of that, all of that was the hallucination. Yeah. Indian country and the whole scene and all the artists, that was the beginning. No, even before when I started, whatever the hallucination, this is where it gelled. This is where it really gave birth. But that's when it was just beginning for me. You know? For me, it was 2014, maybe 2013, 14, or 15. <laughs> 14 was probably when we first started talking about it. When we first started, yeah, when we met. No, we met before. We met way before. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, 2013 or 14, I got an email. Um, with a little 30 second loop and they were like uh, hey uh, we have this loop that we think you would like and you might do something with it what, what do you think and I really liked it and then because I am a sliver extra I was like oh, let me do something great so I wrote an entire song and I added like Afro-Colombian drums and violin, and I like wrote this like this song like very epic about you know light and and, and, and love and and um, like friendship and gratitude and, and letting go and so I sent it I sent it to them and they heard it and they were like well I guess uh, <laughs> I guess we're gonna do this album then um, and then little by little I. Started getting more and more bits of the music and we started talking more and more about what the, what the songs were, what the concept of the hallucination was and we were both going through like by both I mean me and, and the band, we were going through these transitions and like letting go of people and like yeah just of people and experiences in both of our lives and we were realizing that we had a lot of that in common and of course um Touring with Tribe, because like my first, I guess my first tour that I ever did was being a, the support for a Tribe for Red. So in that tour, I, I really learned, you know, I really learned what, what, what it was like to put a concept together. And I, and I learned what, you know, like, et, like tour etiquette, what, what that meant and, 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 and the discipline that it takes to to bring your message forth and, and, and through to people. So it was important to me, you know, as a, as a, as a young 
as a young artist and, and new to, to, to the country and to know, you know, the importance of relationships with, with indigenous people yeah. and, and, and the importance of um, understanding that Canada is, is a project and we're all part of it. Yeah. Like we're, we're, we're a part of, of, of this machine. So, so in the concept of the hallucination and the things that I was learning through performing on stage and performing for those massive audiences that I didn't have access to before to understand like, oh, actually it doesn't matter that I don't speak English, uh, sorry, that I don't sing in English. Uh, it actually doesn't matter that, you know, my style of music is, 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 is different to what tribe, tribe are doing. It still makes sense because we're still, we're still attached through all of these experiences. So that's how, you know, I, I became a part of it and then somehow ended up with three songs instead of one song, you know, because it just keeps growing and every time that we're together or, or even just like visiting at home, like we realize like, oh, there is all this room to explore, all this room to grow because of our experiences. In indigeneity, they, they're guiding th this, this path. So that's how I see it. Like I just see it as this ongoing, this ongoing narrative that, you know, it's gonna enter another phase and then it's gonna enter another phase and in that phase it's only gonna get better and better and it's gonna be named differently but it's still the same, the same. essence is there. Yeah. Of yeah, we, we share a, a narrative, and and we need to be in control okay. of our destiny, and yeah. we need to be in control of this creativity. Yeah. So that's how uh, that's how we. Yeah, I think after the experience of the hallucination, I think it, it changed a lot for each artist's creative process and the way we started reaching out to within our community but also realizing the, the space that we all take up and like how important, it's like Voltron, like Wu-Tang, back to Wu-Tang, right? In a way, uh, musically speaking, but cult culturally speaking, when I first had the conversation with you guys about the hallucination, and I want you to sort of jam out on that, it's like, um, we had met in a very serendipitous way through Buddha, and Buddha had introduced me to, you know, Ganawagi and the reality there, and, and relating it back to Iraq and all these things, but then when we had the conversation and Yasin Bey came into play. Um, it felt like, I remember us saying to each other in the studio, we were like, yo, this is like destiny right now, like this moment. All the, the superheroes have come together for a meeting, <laughs> right? We, it was like when the Justice League meet at the, the big screen, right? So, um, for you, inheriting it from Trudell, inheriting this concept and flourishing it and, and making it a, a super group, or like an, a super idea. Um, what was the weight of that responsibility for you, number one? And then number two, how did you let it flow? Were you like reaching out for people or did, was it naturally sort of the universe was lining up? Yeah. Um, well, I think like so many things, it, it was all those things happening at the same time. So with uh, with John, we had uh, we met in Albuquerque after a couple of years of kind of circling each other, where like we were here through the grapevine, and John knew who we were and really wanted was excited about our music and wanted to meet us. Uh, Jen, knowing him, had tried to connect us a couple of times. We had met his niece and his daughter, and like you know, it was like we were really circling each other, but the moment hadn't come to meet yet until uh, so we were playing in. Uh, in New Mexico uh, during Indian market. He happened to be in town. He wasn't performing at our show, but had asked to come and introduce us. Uh, and when he came into, the, into the, the green room, somehow it ended up just being me there by myself. And he walked in, I jumped up to shake his hand, and basically tried to, tried to explain to him how much he meant to me and how much his work meant to me. He wasn't having any of it. He was just like, yeah, 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 that's, that's fine. Great. Let's move on. But like, he already knew my name which was our, like, just, that just kind of stopped me in my tracks, and then started telling me about what our music meant to him, and explained that, like, he had, it took him half of his life to do what we figured out naturally, you know? Uh, and so, right from that first meeting, he brought up the idea of working together before we could. He was like, you know, 
they might give you some writing. Uh, could you do something with that? Yeah, you were like, I really about it. <laughs> and then just started reading stuff, like pulling out my notebook, and <laughs> reading something. Hey, how about this piece? And it would be, it's just like, yeah, of course, anything, anything. Um, but it was still like another year before we actually started directly working together, and uh, uh, we were in process in the process of making the album. And it's funny you bring up the superhero thing because we knew it was going to be a uh, a collaborative album. We knew it was. I really wanted it to be a um, a concept album and to have this this whole story and do more than just a club music album. Uh, so I started writing stories, and the first story I wrote was a superhero story. Uh, it was at the tribe called Red, where like, you know, the, the 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 Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman of Justice League, and now we're going out to find the rest of our allies. Um, and that that story kind of went a little ways. It got far enough to like talk to a comic artist here in, in uh, Toronto, actually, Jeff uh, Jeff Lemaire, who's an amazing writer and artist. Uh, and uh, but that that kind of progressed and changed into a uh, western story where we were bandits. Or like outlaws, yeah. and like you know, what's the difference between an outlaw and a revolutionary? And you know that we were like this like uh, group of bandits who were going like like, like a what do you call it, the Magnificent Seven, yeah. and we're going out to find the rest of our allies. So that whole story came together, and then uh, talking with John, and he wrote a poem for us called A Tribe Called Red, and he had recorded it for us and sent it to us, and we were working with that and. We finally got him into a studio to record it uh, professionally. And he sent us the recording, and then he's like, oh, yeah, and then there's this other little bit in there, too, another poem. You guys can do something with that if you want. And that was the whole use of So wow. we heard that, and it was like, okay, this is obviously our story. Um, but it was, I mean, it's a, it's a poem, right? So you're kind of, there's a lot of space to be filled. Uh, so I started filling all that space with ideas I've been working on for most of my life, um, which are which you know I've been working on a lot of like sci-fi kind of stories and superhero stories for a long time. You know, going back to like high school where I, you know I had a character who, when I think about it, what like represents a lot of hallucination where he was uh, this like native superhero who had the ability to, to teleport himself, but he spent his his lifetime teleporting around the world to different uh, indigenous peoples and people who were connected to the earth and gathering all this knowledge together. And then he like had this crazy mishmash of things that he drew from. Uh, and so like those kind of ideas have been bumping around my head. And uh, there was actually a story I had been working on that was a kind of future story about um, well, I'll get into the whole story, but the, 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 the parts that I used to fill the hallucination were from that story. Um, so, part, so part of what goes into the hallucination are ideas I've had forever, and then what John gave us um, coming together. Um, what helped what, what, you, what, you, what Yeah, sorry, what, what helped you after the concept was built? How did you know who to go to? <laughs> or did that sort of, they came into your life and they were like, oh my God, that person has to, oh my God, that, you know, like. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the process of anybody we're going to work with starts with what are they saying. That's that's the number one thing, you know. Like even right now, we're having a conversation about a, an artist we want to work with would make a really great song, but it would just be a happy song. And like, are we ready to do that? <laughs> Which in the new album we might be, but it's always a question. You know, what do they stand for? What are they saying? What are they saying? What does it mean for us to work with them? So everybody who's on the album, you know, has to go through that. The vetting process. process, exactly. <laughs> and I think part of the reason that we're so strict about that, I mean, part of it comes with because of the drum groups that we work with and that everything that we do and everything that we put out has to still respect those drums. Um, but it's also that this, this you know, you, you said it you know, perfectly earlier that the, there's, there's a weight to what John gave us and that he gave us, he gave us something huge. <laughs> And when we met him, you know, the, he, um, I don't even talk about this, but he, he was sick when we, when we met him already. And uh, the last time that we got to see him, he was, he was very ill. And we went to his house, and we spent like maybe two or three hours there, and it was just like a download. Mm. It was this huge download of information, and it was so thick and so heavy that 
I don't think I'll ever be able to completely unpack it all. So he left us with something of responsibility there, you know, as well, as this huge gift. And we, can, we, we take that responsibility really seriously. So whenever we're bringing people into this, it's yes. always with like the thought of, you know, how does this reflect in his memory? How does this reflect mm -hmm. in what he gave us? Mm -hmm. um, there's, one, yeah, there's one other point I wanted to make that I lost. <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, it's crazy because the moment in which you guys were producing the album and reaching out to all of us and the creative process had started, right? Uh, I was at a point, like I said, where I had just had my first son and I had put out my album, which was like a message to him. And I started tracking, like I started getting in touch with my heroes in a very, very natural way. It wasn't like I was reaching out to them. Um, and you guys were doing the same, and it felt as though like a, a like a changing of the guard, almost like a like a, if we were running a marathon together. Everybody, they were passing, people were passing batons down. And um, if I was to fast forward to the album being done, and you calling me and being like, "Listen, this is the prelude story. I need you to go shoot it." And remember, I had to fly to Cape Town to go shoot the music video because Yasin couldn't leave Cape Town. Um, for, for reasons of nationalism and identity and passport and movement. So it was like very, everything was lining up in front of us, right? And the day I landed in Cape Town, we went to sleep and saw a guy was on the plane with me because he was producing the video and he was wearing a Muhammad Ali jersey when he hopped off the plane. I was like, I always wanted that sweater, you know? Went to sleep, woke up, Muhammad Ali died that morning. Okay? I probably never told you this story, but I went location scouting. We went and met with Mos with Yassin. We all cried together like we knew Muhammad Ali, but because he had such a powerful impact on all of us. He was, he was black, he was Muslim, he was all the things that we were combined together, right? We went to the street that I had Pinterest research to shoot on because it was that colorful street with all those houses. Mm -hmm. And there was a mosque. Turns out that's the oldest Muslim community in Cape Town. I didn't know that. The only street that the city gave us rights to shoot on were this one side street that we ended up shooting on, and the mosque was on that street. And that was the last mosque that Muhammad Ali prayed in when he went to Cape Town. Mm -hmm. So we shot that, and then we went to the second location, which was by the mountains. There was a kid playing ball, like playing with a soccer ball with his friends. And while they were setting up the camera, I started talking to him. I was like, what's your name? He's like, Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and I was like, is your father here because I need to make sure this is real? <laughs> we shot that scene and there was a scene we wanted to shoot by like a depth, like a, like a corner store, but they're made out of old uh, tanks, like uh, craters, right? Uh, crates, sorry. And we couldn't shoot because the lighting was bad. It was too late in the day. We had taken too long. So we had to go by the water where we shot the pickup scene where they pick us up in the back of the truck and we put the niqabs on us yeah. and stuff. And it was nighttime. So whatever, we wrapped the shoot up. It felt, it all went very smoothly. Next day for day two, before we went to set, I went to buy the newspaper and it had the story of uh, Muhammad Ali's last time in Cape Town. And it tracked the entire path that we took to shoot the video down to him walking from that mosque to that lookout point where we shot this, the pickup scene. So in that moment, I looked at Saul and I was like, you know, this is not us. Like, this is our ancestors guiding our path for us to all come together. You know, and I wish I had made this up because it sounds really magical. It's also untrue. But I wanted to thank you for that, number one, because I would have never had that life experience and that sort of creative experience. But I think that's the beauty of the hallucination is that you guys took all of us who question our homeland and our belonging and where we stand in history and, were, and you were like, listen, Stand back, here's the platform, now let's all aim in the directions that we want to go to, you know? Um, and if it wasn't for Trudeau, and if it wasn't for Ali, uh, I don't think we'd be in the position that we're in right now. Dude, right? Dude, you brought up that video, and like I learned so much from you in that video. Like, one of, one of the things, because we, we basically, for part of, well, for at least part of the concept, we said, you know, so much of a tribe called Red is about us representing ourselves, how we want to be seen, and we want to give you that opportunity, you and, and Yassin to show yourselves and your culture and how you want to 
God want to show it and want to be seen. And there was uh, when you guys are praying, there's all these things that like I don't I don't understand that you know when you look at it when like say Hollywood movies when they show when they, when they when show people praying they always show the balance right mm -hmm. but what you guys show was the, rising. the rising you showed the the breathing and you showed the, the washing the hands in the sand where you don't have water and mm -hmm. things that you have to be part of the culture to know mm -hmm. and then you put that in a music video mm -hmm. you know so what that then people from your own community get to see that and see you representation. know representation real real representation right um, when we showed that video in the class in Dubai uh, and talking about that and just watching people like watching people's faces realize that and that you know that that control of how you get to show your image was really huge um, and the other part too is like when you when you escape in the in the cause right mm -hmm. and that again something that I don't really understand all the parts that go into that but that it was an important part of the story to you um, and then we made the, that into a big part of the video, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the road crossing, and that's where we bring in uh, John. John's voice and, and the whole black and white part of the video. Um, that, during the time when that video was, was being produced, uh, my grandfather passed away. And realized after the video was done and that we had told his story from when he escaped from France. Wow. Uh, you know, like in like a horse and carriage, or a horse and buggy, and he was like smuggled across the border. Or he had papers, that's how he was able to get out. And the alienation papers. Yeah, the militarized zone. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's having this realization, like you were saying, ancestors guiding the story. Yeah. Like here, we had folded, like this, it's like we had worked on writing that story together. Yeah. But at no point was I thinking about his story. Yeah. And then when I saw it on screen, I was like, oh, we just told that. I mean, there's so much we could get into when it comes to where it's going. So I'd like to just ask you guys one question. You know, what's next when it comes to you individually as artists? How has the hallucination experience informed your creative process? And where do you, and then at the end with you, what do you, where do you guys want to take this concept that you, you helped grow and then push forward? So Jen, Lito, what are you guys doing right now and what's next? Um, well, some really good friends of mine have offered to produce my album, so hopefully we'll get to that soon when they're not busy, they're super busy. <laughs> and then, uh, well, the hallucination, I have to say this, sadly, sorry for your question. <laughs> um, <laughs> low blood sugar. It's all gone. That's a very forgettable it's question, don't worry about it. No, I have to say this, you made me say it, because you guys are dudes, so that makes sense. But I have to say this, as a woman, when these guys came on the scene and working with these guys, it was the first time I ever got to go to a club. Every time I've ever gone dancing before, I've had someone touching my abs, someone, you know, just out of the blue or whatever. That's never happened, ever, at an Tribe Club or a show. I went to all their shows from back when, you know, they were, whatever would come to the stage earlier on. And so I've all, I need this to be said out loud. They've sort of made this safe space for the women in our community um, to shake ass or just to go and be free on the dance floor. And I don't feel like I ever had that before Tribe. It was sort of like a for us, by us moment. Yeah. And that's been very important for me. And I try to bring everybody that I can, especially all of the female women. And uh, I think that's evidence in their work and working with them at different times. I'm always treated with a lot of respect, and I'm always treated um, like family. And that's important, because not a lot of men do that. And I just think that's important to inject in the conversation with what's going on now in the world. Thank that's you, Jen. Um, what's next? What's next is my album. Miss Columbia. <laughs> so you did become Miss Columbia, actually. <laughs> Great. You did it for yourself. That's how it should be done. Yep. Um, which is basically a collection of cynical love, cynical love letters to uh, the country that I was born. Um, I guess what I learned from the hallucination, or what I took from the experience of the hallucination, 
that I know that I'm putting <coughs> towards my album right now is thinking about beyond the music, <coughs> beyond the message, how do you encapsulate both messages visually, mm. or, like, or those things visually, and how can you make a big production with any budget that you're given, or whatever whatever budget you're, you're able to get your hands into, how, what's the best that you can do within the limitations of whatever you got or within the message that you want to convey. So, um, Bear came to town and then we had this meeting and then like, I don't know where he's like, so, are you gonna direct the next video? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about film or anything like that, but I do have friends that are, um, that have a production company and, it's like, and, and they, they're called Porch. And then I called them up and I was like, oh, um, so I'm gonna direct the next video for a try, but I wanna do it in South America. So um, in, in the process of, you know, getting in touch, like justifying to the entities that were going to give the budget, <laughs> justify why are you going to do this video in Chile, out of all places, like you're not even in the north of the north, of the, in the north of, the, of South America. You're going to the south of South America. To delegating um, responsibilities to a proper film crew and a proper production company, you know, to, you know, and like because the message of the hallucination is to, you know, forget about borders, right? Like, forget about, you know, citizenship. So I, I took, I went with that in mind to Chile and then learned all these stories from people there and realized how similar, again, how similar our, our narratives are. So because I was there and because of the, the song that we were gonna shoot and with the people that we were shooting it with, I knew that, okay, this, this is gonna work out and the video turned out great and the response was, like per usual, polarizing, you know, people love it and some people critique it and, you know, um, but mainly it was, it was an amazing experience. So now in my own project, I'm, I'm doing the same. I'm, 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 I have this concept of Miss Columbia uh, and, and, and I am going to create this, this visual, this, this visual element, this visual package that, that supports the, the musical the musical message so so yeah like it uh, made you think bigger yeah like I I, 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 I I am a very organized person and and, and my and I have great ideas <laughs> but but you know it's important to have a team of people that are rooting for you all the way and that are telling you, here we trust you. You know, what usually that that doesn't really happen. You know, so so for me it was just like, oh, I'm going to Chile and I'm gonna shoot a video. Hope it goes well. It's worth trying for red, you know. So but that was good. If if the bear didn't have the confidence that he has in me, maybe I wouldn't have that confidence for my projects, you know, and then other artists are asking me to do things do their video, so if, if, if he, you know, he's like, oh, you're ready, and I'm like, oh, I'm ready, yeah, you are, yeah, yeah go, go, let's, let's, let's talk in a month, show me the storyboards later, and, and it happened, and it was really good, so now I'm like, okay, with that experience, with the three videos that I have to shoot in Colombia, in, probably in December, we have this whole plan done, we work together, I'm bringing the same uh, production, from the, the same team, we're bringing it, we're bringing, now, bringing them to Colombia, so, you know, it's great. So that spirit is, it's, it's imprinted in it. Amazing. There, what's next? Uh, well, we're not done with hallucination yet. That's something that, you know, is gonna carry on the next, the next album mm -hmm. and everything we're doing. What we're doing here today is part of that. You know, this whole, uh, um, with Tim and this hallucination band idea that we're, that we're gonna bring out tonight is, uh, is part of the next phase of the band. Um, you know, I'd say I drew from a lot of like my sci-fi stuff for the last album, and, uh, and uh, my favorite sci-fi writer is uh, 
Frank Herbert. I love the Dune books. Like those are, you know, I, I draw from those a lot. And one of my favorite things about the Dune books is that in every book he has these, you know, um, these characters who know the truth and they know the way that things have to be have to happen in the world. And in the next book, they're wrong. And everything they did was wrong. And the next character has to tear it all down and start over again. And then, well, no, that other guy was so so wrong. Uh, and what I learned from that is to always question what I'm doing in my work and question it the most when it's successful. Uh, so we created this like, you know, this futuristic sci-fi world of struggle that people really connected to. You know? And I think it's because we are in that, in that time, in this time of struggle, but it's also that that, that, that struggle is becoming comfortable. Existing within the struggle is becoming a place where people want to exist and can't see themselves living outside of that. What's, the, yeah, like what's after the struggle? What's after the struggle? Yeah. Right. So I thought that's that was like that, okay. So like I got to question why I put something out that was about struggle and people gravitated to it and it worked. So if we're only going to be stuck in struggle, what are we struggling for? That if we can use that same you know that kind of uh, future vision, futurism that you find in sci-fi that so quickly becomes reality. Well, the idea of hallucination was like, let's dream another kind of sci-fi. Well, let's, now let's dream another kind of world. Yeah. You know, let's. Uh, a lot of the concept for where we're going with the next album came from a Damian Marley song uh, called "The Struggle Discontinued," and it's uh, his version of "No More Struggle" from his father. And uh, in it, he talks about how he wants to see the struggle die and wither away so we don't have to struggle anymore. Mm -hmm. And when I heard those lyrics, it, like something clicked, you know, and, and that's what I want to envision in the next album. I want to envision what happens after the struggle's over, what do we do the, day, the next day, and let's start dreaming about what, what that looks like. Amazing. Thank you all. Thank you for, like, changing big parts of our lives and, and expanding our creative spaces and ideas and ways of thinking. And I'm glad that we're all sharing these spaces together and to the future of the hallucination. Before we wrap it up, I gotta say, like, I mean, I have, I, it's mutual. You know, I learn and grow so much with the three of you as well. You know, so we're all doing this together. <laughs> Thank you, guys. you want to ask any of the artists on the panel, feel free. Um, and then we have to show later on tonight as well the performance. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just a comment for the fair. Thank you for this festival. Fair. It's fantastic. And your music. Um, my band was on a, a bit of a try for the Panic Games a few years ago. Our band draws on the original sort of late 60s, early 70s deep funk that uh, was sampled a lot in hip hop. So through that, we dug deep into that music and dug deep into the civil rights, um, the civil rights history, and you know, hearing you guys with the, the samples of the of the chanting and the indigenous singing uh, was a real eye opener for me. And as someone who um, is uh, moves around this land with a certain amount of uh, privilege. Um, was able to, that music really helped me to sort of question and dig in deep to the, uh, the, the story and do the indigenous Canada courses of the University of Alberta, and um, really start me on the journey to try in some way to uh, become uh, a better ally. Anybody else? <coughs> yes. Yeah, hi. Um, I really enjoy your album. I think it's um, a really great inspiration for me. And I'm actually from Australia, visiting Canada. Yeah. So um, it's actually the music's coming all the way from across the board as well. So it's, it's great. And um, I was just wondering, actually, because you were talking about the collaborations on the album with uh, Yaz and Faye and yourself. And, um, how was uh, the collaboration with Saul Williams? 
Um, his uh, manager, or his former manager, uh, had become. Well, we originally we originally oh, blah, blah. we are originally met because uh, he was playing in Ottawa, and he told his manager at the time, "Hey, these guys are from Ottawa. I need to meet them." And his manager uh, then was um, Dave Gannett, and Dave Gannett and our manager Guillaume had known each other and worked together. And it's like, ah, I think I know those guys' manager. And, you know, one thing, they, they put together a meeting at a Tex-Mex restaurant. <laughs> and, uh, and the idea to collaborate was instant. You know, we definitely wanted to work together. Uh, and it was another one of those things that was just waiting for the right moment to come together. Yeah, it's a great song. I love the, the dubstep influence. In yeah. yeah. That was a really fun one to work with. You know, he, did, he would do stuff like record some stuff like you know we have all that breathing and uh, and record some of his some of his lines and then he'd come back in and be like yeah yeah, yeah but, but don't use it like you know me talking I use it use my voice like an instrument you know <laughs> like it was like it was really really good to work with he he pushed us and was able to um, get us to work in ways that we, we hadn't really tried before. Yes. I was just wondering, like, say someone wanted to, like, join the Who Solution, who, hallucination. hallucination, how would they do that? <laughs> well, you're here, so you're already part of it. There you go. Welcome to the team. Anybody else? Yeah. Just in terms of when you're saying about moving forward to, like, what happens. Um, the question I still have is just on an international level, especially in getting that message, because it isn't just the, like we said, like the commonalities that are there between all people and the struggles that have gone, people have gone through across the world. Um, a lot of like big music festivals, especially, is a place where there's music primarily with the intention to escape. But if you like, like especially like even last night, even um, the Royal Family, the Cousin Study, it wasn't just about escape. Yes, the music was very bass heavy, but you could feel the difference in terms of the instruments that were being used, the sound that was being displayed. And I just wanted to know if you have a vision or um, how you were with that um, the ending of the show to bring it to that. Now the sound is more for connecting the world rather than uh, sort of just escaping. Um, so I was wondering what vision you had for it, if that was something you um, Yeah, no, there's definitely some of that that goes into it. Um, and a lot of it has to do with. Um, the experiences I had growing up in youth culture and, and the things that I see missing, particularly in youth culture now. Uh, I'm somebody who was fortunate enough that, you know, when I was about 15, uh, I did a manhood fast, you know, and I had that really clear coming of age, going from one thing to the next, uh, that, you know, is really missing now, you know. Um, and not, I mean, not long after that is when I started going to raves and got into that whole scene and like really saw a group of people who were searching for something, you know? And uh, you know, you're, you're going and having these massive group experiences, but it's not, it's, it, there was no real goal to it. There wasn't any kind of control to it. It's just this wild, almost dangerous energy. Uh, and a lot of people like, you know, get lost because there isn't any uh, any rules or any intention or any directed point to it. But what I saw were people looking for that, that kind of transition, that kind of transformative thing in their lives. Um, so when I, you know, when I was going to parties and stuff, I, I remember having the realization that there's so much energy here, there's so much power in these, that, that people are just playing with and throwing around here, that if it had a point, if it had a destination that that would be, you know, that's the thing that these people are looking for, uh, and, you know, and uh, I would, that was always in the back of my mind, DJ, was that how can we add something real to, to, to the party, you know, uh, and I saw it in little bits and pieces, like I was, two of my favorite groups were the Asian Dove Foundation and uh, Congo Nadi which were two groups that were really putting a lot of, a lot of culture <laughs> and a lot 
of, uh, you know, having political songs that were being played at raves, you know, and that's where the spark started going off in my brain saying that this is something, there's something here, there's something to be followed. Um, I forgot about that and went on my life doing other things and then with Tribe, I realized one day that, that we were doing that, that we were having these parties, but that there was more to it. You know, you can just come and dance and, and, and interact with it on that surface level, but if you want to dig deeper, if you want to be part of something greater, that, but, you know, like I would have answered your question, being there makes you part of it, you know? And that, you know, what it's become now in, you know, my, my adult life and looking at our audiences uh, here in, you know, in Canada, in, in the Americas, it's so difficult to have, to, to start the conversation that needs to be had between indigenous people and settlers, that even to mention the conversation starts a fight, and that when you even talk about indigenous rights, which are really human rights at this point, you know, like we, we all need to drink water, we all need to breathe air, we all need to live on this earth, so, you know, but to even talk about those indigenous rights attacks the basis of the colonial structure, the colonial lie. So when we start having things like we're talking about reconciliation and all this kind of stuff, that we're like three steps ahead of where we are, to, like that conversation is on a table that we haven't even built the solid ground to have that conversation on, and that we can't build it because we just get into fights every time we try to talk about it. That has to do with our experiences and these very different experiences that we have in our lives. And uh, when I look out at one of our shows and I see the incredible mix of backgrounds, of ages, of everything that come to our to our parties, having a common experience. They're all listening to these Palau remixes and I see the same reactions and faces regardless of age, regardless of background. That's a common experience. That is the beginning of having a level piece of ground to build that table on so we can get to those conversations. Yeah, I think that's I think that's happening. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to Yeah, no, like I there's I, I see people at our shows interacting on so many different levels. You know, there there <laughs> there's always goes back to this one memory in Edmonton playing on like a Tuesday night to a packed crowd going nuts. And I look up at one point and somebody was crying, somebody was praying and someone was flashing her breasts. <laughs> like that's, you know, that, 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 that was one moment in a show. So I think, yeah, people are, are, are connecting on so many different levels to what's going on. Some people are just there for the party. Some people, there's this, there was this phenomenon where people started crying at our shows for a long time. It, it's, I've seen less of it now, but there was a time about a year ago where people would just weep through whole chunks of our show, mm. you know, and then again, and then seeing somebody pray, like you know, it's like <laughs> it's all over the place, um, and I think that's because we don't put any expectations. You know, we we're we're a group of party DJs, so our basis was to throw a party where people come out and dance and have a good time. So if that happens, we've done our job. 
all the other layers are there for people if they want it, you know, with the video, with the videos, you know, with these, uh, you know, one-dimensional or racist depictions of indigenous people, they can be funny. You know, like when we, when Priya and I performed here on Thursday, there was lots of people laughing. And some people came up after, like, I hope that was supposed to be funny. It's like, yes, totally. We need to be able to laugh at these things. We also need to be able to be confronted with these things. We need to be able to um, allow people to, to, to use their own experiences to interact with the show. So we never want to do anything too direct. It's, we're always leaving things open for, to, for people to fill the gaps with themselves, with their own experiences. So the headdress conversation sparked in a way where it wasn't happening and needed to. And yeah, well, I mean, the, yeah, there was that. I mean, fortunately, a conversation that we've had to have less and less. Uh, yeah, about the, the headdresses and Ben Redface at shows. Um, but the amazing thing about that conversation is that, <clears throat> yes, we, we got involved with it and, and had some part in it. But really, the change came from festivals themselves. And like, not just festivals we were playing at, you know, that, that started to say like, no, we're banning headdresses. If you show up in war paint, you'll be asked to, you know, wash your face. And, you know, like, and then now it's not like you have to worry about us at our shows. It's like, it's our fans. <laughs> our, our fans will tell you to go wash your face. <laughs> you know, our, I, one, of, one of the best moments was realizing that uh, our, our very French manager, like from Orléans, France, uh, we started stopping people before we could see them because he didn't want it to affect us. So he'd get out there, he'd stand at the door and stop people before they even got in <laughs> to the show because he didn't want it to have to be G, something yeah. that fell on our shoulders. That's amazing. Yeah, G really gets it. Yeah, G gets it, of course. I have a comment. Yes. I, of course, am familiar with Ben Redface said that you didn't have a uh, capacity for making music or playing music when you were small, but what you did, besides be able to pick out which was the violin, which was the trumpet, which was, you conducted. Anytime there was music on TV, on the radio, on your, your cassette player, you were the conductor, and you conducted for hours. And you're still conducting. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that you come by really honestly as a as a conductor and heart opener. Heart opener. I wasn't, and you're conducting that. And I wasn't expecting this uh, panel to be so emotional. <laughs> but this if this is the Justice League in the flesh. <laughs> I don't know what is. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Milady, Nyalabal. It's my mom. That's, yeah, that's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys for coming out. This is what the show. So doors are going to open momentarily, and uh, the show starts today. Hope to see you out there. Thank you. <laughs>